Over the past uh, few weeks at Grace, we've been looking at uh, trying to remind ourselves about Christmas, talking about Christ being a light that came into the darkness. And we looked at Christ as a light of hope. We looked at Christ as a light of peace. We looked at Christ as a light of joy. This morning, what I want to look at is Jesus Christ as the light of love. And that's really what Christmas is about, right? As we just heard in that children's story, that Christmas is about God showing his love towards us. The most recognized verse in the Bible probably is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He gave his son. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. The ultimate expression of love given towards us. And you know, unlike our culture that kind of looks at love in all kinds of different ways and primarily thinks of love as kind of an emotion or kind of a feeling, the reality is that love is more expressed in actions. Think about when's the last time you felt loved? It probably was not just because somebody thought something or said something, but it, it was because of actions, right? It, now, the, 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 what they felt caused the actions, but it is the actions that made you feel loved. And there is no greater action of love than God sending his only son to save us. This morning, I want to look at two passages briefly that show us this love of God, how, is it, how is it is expressed through the sending of his son and also the effects of that love for us. And so the first verse I want to look at, if you have a Bible, you can turn there, I think it might be on the screen, but John 15, 12 through 13. And here we see the expression of God's love. John 15, 12 through 13, it says this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now the setting of this story is the upper room. And what the upper room is, is, is this time with, that Jesus had with his disciples right before he was going to be betrayed and eventually was going to go to the cross. And during that time, and, and we, we capture that in, in, in the book of John, there's this really sweet, intimate time that he has with his disciples, communicating to them what he wants them to do when he leaves. And, and here we see his final words. And in his final words, he reiterates for them the most significant command that he has for them. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. If you are my disciple, if you are my follower, follow my example and love one another. And then in verse 13, he outlines what that, the, the, the greatest example of what that love actually is. He says this, greater love has none, no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is saying here, there's no greater example of love than someone lay down his life for someone he loves. Now, God forbid this would ever happen to any of us. But if you found yourself in a situation where there was an active shooter and, and you were in danger, I don't know about what you would do, but I have a feeling that my natural response would be to hide, right? It would be to run and hide behind something. Now, I, I wish, I hope I was brave enough, you know, that I'd end up on the news, like jumping in front of some random stranger. But I just, knowing me, knowing my, my natural instinct would be to kind of protect myself and hide. Unless, unless my family was with me. Because if my family was there, if my wife and my ch children were there, my natural reaction, my first instinct would be to jump in front of them and to shield them behind me and to try to take whatever was coming my way because I would rather die than lose the ones I love. 
the greatest expression of love would be to lay down your life for the life of someone else. And Jesus is not talking here just in abstracts. He's not talking in generic terms. He is referencing what is actually going to take place by his own life in a matter of hours. He is going to willingly give his life out of love for others. And he says, follow my example and love in that way. Love one another as I'm about to demonstrate to you as I lay down my life for you. That is the expression of love. And, that, and then what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 fleshes this out for us and we see there the effects of God's love. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, the context for this passage is Paul is explaining how we as sinful humans can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And the word reconciled means to restore a broken relationship, right? Our relationship with God was broken. Sin breaks our relationship with God. When we disobey his law, when we violate his commands, our relationship is broken with God because God is holy and just and he cannot accept sin. Sin requires consequences and so that relationship is broken. You know, it's like when you feel a sense of injustice, even in this world, right? When you see a criminal go to jail and then they're immediately released and they go right back and commit the same crime, don't you feel a sense of like injustice? Like, come on, do your job. Why would you not have that person face consequences for harming somebody? Why would you allow that to happen? There's a sense of injustice because sin or harming others requires consequences. And the consequences of that, the Bible say, are that we are separated from God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. What we earn or deserve, that's what a wage is. What we deserve for our rebellion against God is separation from God. Because God is perfectly holy. And so there's a problem. We're sinful. God is holy. How in the world can we be reconciled? That's what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 5.21. How a holy God can be reconciled to sinful humanity. That's the question that he's answering. And the answer is this. It's because Jesus took our place. You see this, what Paul says here is for our sake, right? We were the ones with the problem. We were the ones that had sinned against God. We were the ones who deserved God's just punishment. But instead of receiving that, we were the ones who were given grace and mercy because of God's love. For our sake, he made him to be sin. Now, the the first he here, he is God the Father, right? The one who created the plan of salvation, the one who, who, who made a way for us to be saved. It was the Father who was motivated by love, we see throughout the scriptures, who made a plan for sinful humanity to be reconciled back to him. The reality is that we could not save ourselves. In, in opposition to what so many religions teach, religion teaches ways that we can get to God, that we can earn our way to God, that we can somehow rescue ourselves. The Bible teaches something far different. It teaches a doctrine of grace that God had to come and rescue us, that we could not save ourselves, that God had to come and save us and make a way because we had no way apart from him to be rescued. He made him. The second him here is is Christ. 
This is the second person of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity. He made Jesus Christ, and then he says this, to be sin. Now the words to be are uh, implied there from the Greek. Literally in the Greek it says, he made him sin. What does it mean that he made him to be sin? Or to to sin? What, What does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean that Jesus sinned in any way. It doesn't mean that Jesus personally sinned. Right? We see that from the next phrase because it says, the one who knew no sin. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sinless in every way, both in thought and in deed. He never violated God's law. And I can show you verse after verse after verse in the New Testament that reflects that. But Jesus was perfect and holy and sinless. So what does it mean then that Christ was made to be sin? It means that Christ took our sins upon himself and stood in our place in relationship to the Father. It means that when God looked at the Son, he instead of seeing the perfect righteousness of the Son, saw my sin and your sin. Jesus stood in our place and experienced the consequences that we deserved. Have you ever had someone take the fall for you? Probably at some point, right? You did something. Maybe it was at school. Maybe it was at work. Maybe it was with your siblings. If you have a big brother, then you definitely allowed someone else to take the fall for you. Something that you did, something that you caused, something that you broke, and you allowed another sibling to take the fall, and you stood back and you just hoped that it was never found out what you did. And your brother's like, you're going to pay for this later. This is, you're going to, this, something's going to happen to you later. But they took the fall for you, right? Jesus is the big brother who takes our punishment upon himself, and he does it willingly, not begrudgingly. Not because he has to, because he chooses to. He takes our punishment. And what is that punishment? Well, on the cross, we see that he is separated from his father, right? And, and there's, how does that happen? I mean, it's beyond our comprehension. But for a fraction of a moment in time, because Jesus Christ takes the sin of the world upon himself, right? In Matthew 27, 46, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one who had eternally been in relationship with the Father, because he took our sin upon himself, is separated from the Father. And he feels the separation for the first time. And he does that. Because he loves us. He bears the wrath of God that sin deserves to satisfy God's justice. What you and I would experience for an eternity in hell, Jesus experienced upon the cross. Taking our sin and the wrath that it deserves upon himself so that, here's the beautiful thing, so that you and I do not have to face that wrath. Because Jesus stood in our place, we can be forgiven. We can be reconciled, right? Why would Jesus do that? That's what the the rest of the verse says. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the purpose clause. So that in him, through Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, that is the good news of the Christian gospel. It is that Jesus stood in our place and took our penalty and gave us his righteousness. And because we have been given his righteousness through faith, we are now acceptable to God. We can be reconciled back with a holy God for eternity because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is the great exchange. Not only does Christ stand in our place as, as, as us, in a sense, right? He takes our sin upon himself. Not only does that take place, but through faith, Jesus gives us his righteousness. When God looks at you, if you are his by faith, 
He looks at the perfect righteousness of his son. By faith, we are united with Christ in his death and his resurrection, and his righteousness is credited to us. That is amazing. Not only does God treat Christ in the way that we deserve, but he treats us in the way that only Christ deserves for his perfect righteousness. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow and you opened up your bank account and you realized that your bank account and Elon Musk's bank account had been switched. (laughs) There would be shock. (laughs) There would be wonder. Right? How could this possibly happen? But Christ exchanged something so much greater than money. He exchanged his own life for us. How much greater shock and wonder should we experience that Christ has given us his righteousness and has taken our sin upon himself? You see, what we celebrate at Christmas is not ultimately what is under the tree, but we celebrate the one who would die upon the tree for our sins, who would go buried into the grave and who three days later would rise again victorious over sin and death and who would offer his righteousness to those that would come to him in faith, to those that would call out to him as Lord, believe what he did and trust in him as Savior, his righteousness would be given to them. He offers us the greatest gift we could ever receive. And why would he do this? Well, John 3.16 tells us that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The motivation of God was his love. And the way that we receive the the righteousness that we are promised is by faith, by believing in what Jesus Christ has done. And so friends, I want to ask you this Christmas, have you trusted in Christ? Have you acknowledged your need for Christ? Believe that you actually needed Jesus to die for you. Believe that you are separated from God because of your sin against God. That's the first step. You must call out and recognize your need. Secondly, you must believe that Christ died for your sins. Truly believe that he died in your place. And finally, confess him as Lord and Savior. The Bible says, if you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. This is the gift of love that is available to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And if you have never received this gift of salvation, what are you waiting for? What are you trusting in apart from what Jesus Christ has done? Because the reality is, the Bible also teaches that apart from Christ, one day you will face this holy God. And if you stand before him in your own unrighteousness, not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, you will face the eternal wrath of God. But the beauty is you don't have to. You don't have to. Christ will give you his righteousness if you will call out to him in repentance and faith. But you must make the decision. And friends, if you have already received this gift, then what a great reason we have to give thanks this Christmas. We have been forgiven. And whatever you find underneath the tree tomorrow ultimately does not matter. What ultimately matters is the one who hung upon the tree for your salvation. That is the ultimate reminder to us that we are loved in Christ. Let's pray and give thanks. Father, thank you so much for just this brief reminder this morning of your great and infinite love towards us. God, I I pray, Father, for anyone that's in here, Lord, that is still trusting in something other than Christ for salvation. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would open their hearts and open their eyes And show them their need and show them the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. 
I pray, Father, that this would be the beginning of walking towards that faith and trusting in you and believing in you. Lord, we give you thanks for that. Lord, we, we just rejoice this morning, Father, because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and it can never be taken away. And so no matter what else happens in this world, no matter what we encounter, no matter what we face, Lord, God, we know that one day that Jesus is coming again. And so we give praise, we give thanks, and we ask, God, that you would help us to be a light to others around us, Lord, that they would be, this, be able to see the hope of the gospel in our lives as well. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.